um, if you if you uh, see in your in the church pew there there's uh, there's yellow cards. Um, staying in touch with us is a is a really uh, really important thing. If you have a prayer request, fill out that card. If you have um, uh, a desire to join the church, fill out that card. If you uh, give us your contact information, we will put you in our in our uh, uh, church mailing list so that you can get a, uh, our Thursday and Beyond uh, newsletter. Um, now, one day we had somebody who who uh, filled out one of those cards, and um, her name is Lisa Vaughn. So, Lisa, if you can come up here, and um, also uh, Daryl, um, Daryl and um, and Lisa are in the same ap apartment complex, and uh, so Daryl has a part in uh, bringing Lisa to our church, and um, one day. Um, Lisa got to the place where she said, I feel like I belong here and I want to join, uh, join this church. So we have something called a profession of faith. And Lisa, oh, I don't have my card. Okay, I will repeat. Um, so what is it, what is it that, um, that um, drew you here? Um, well, Daryl invited me here to his church believe in God and I love God and you know so I wanted to be here at the church okay and did you uh, how did how did you feel like you were received by the people here very welcoming very feel like their family yeah okay you know as as I've got, gotten to know Lisa more um, she's like warm apple pie a la mode <laughs> She's just, she's just an easy person to be around. Um, she, she's, she always seems to be pretty peaceful. And, uh, you know, I've not seen you in an agitated state. We all have those. But, um, Lisa, you are, you are very much welcome here. You are a part of this family. So um, what we need to do at this point is we need a motion to accept uh, Lisa into the membership here at Journey. Okay. And we've got a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I, I heard a pretty loud acclamation there. So, Lisa, um, <laughs> uh, in, in commemoration of this day, we have this uh, certificate for you so that you can always remember uh, the, your, uh, your day that you joined here. And I just happened to make uh, this bread and um, it's been handled by very clean hands. It is safe. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, we want to uh, give you this loaf of bread. Uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And uh, so um, this is yours um, to, uh, to eat or share or however you want to do. And welcome to the family. Thank you. All right. God Thank bless you. you. Amen. All right. Amen. Hmm? Yeah, <laughs> no, I've been very good about keeping these hands clean. All right, uh, today um, we have, boy, I don't think we have any children here. Uh, we got one. Um, have we got children here? Okay, um, so one of the things that we do on, uh, on, on uh, this one Sabbath is we take up the lamb's offering and you might want to know what that is. So kids, come on forward. Do we have a children's story person? Okay, all right. So um, after the children's story, they're going to be bringing around uh, little buckets, and you can put your loose change and your dollar bills and whatever else into that because that helps children to be at the school. And... Um, there are some families that couldn't have their children at the school without our help, and so we just um, encourage you to do that. And so here we are, Tiara, thank you. Am I on? Oh, thank you. All right. Hi, boys. How are you? Good. So instead of telling my story first, I'm going to tell you the memory verse. Joshua 1, 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be courage, strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, 
for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So my parents used to tell me bedtime stories. Does your mom tell you bedtime stories? Yes, she does. <laughs> Anyways, so my parents would read out of a bedtime story book, but one of my favorite stories that I would have my dad read all the time was about a mom and a baby. Now, it was back in the day where they, I don't know. Anyways, I don't know where I was going with that, but it was before you or I were ever thought of. Anyway, so she put her baby down to take a nap and she walked across to the neighbor's house and she probably went to borrow a cup of sugar, I don't remember. But anyways, she was over there chit-chatting and then guess what they heard? They heard sirens, lots and lots of sirens. So what do you think is happening, Logan? No, the house is on fire. So she comes out and she's like, oh no, my baby's in there, my baby's in there. And the firemen were saying, no, 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 you can't go in there. But she said, my baby. And she pushed through the firemen and she ran in and she grabbed her baby and they were all safe. Well, the little girl grew up and always wondered why her mom's hands looked different than hers because her mom's hands had burns all over them. So one day the mom sat her down and I think they were telling a Bible story then too. And she asked her mom, and her mom said, because I, can't, I went in to rescue you, and I will always protect you. So just like that mom will always protect the baby, the little girl, Jesus will protect you as well, okay? All right, you guys can uh, collect money and go back to your seats. Thank you, guys. We have a father who wants the best for us. We have a father that we can turn to in times of uncertainty and distress because he is the good shepherd. With that in mind, let us join together as we seek our father in prayer. Your Lord, this morning we bring everything to you. We bring ourselves. We bring our praises, Father. We bring our joys, our dreams, and our gratitude. Lord, we also bring our heartaches and our cares. Some troubles we face together as a community. Some troubles only you know about. And while we may flinch in the face of troubles, we remember to take heart. In this world, there are troubles, but you have overcome the world. So, Lord, this morning we pause to bring you everything, especially our cares. And, Lord, right now, especially right now, we want to hold up to you some of the most vulnerable in our society who are under a little bit extra attack. And we hold them up to you for protection and healing. And Father, these are people who have done a lot of good things in their lives and taken care of a lot of people. They've got a lot of experience. But now their immune system is not quite as good as it used to be. And so, Lord, we pray for them. Some of them are not here this morning. And so, as we continue our worship today, I pray you give us ears to hear your words. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Wow. I think I'm getting some vitamin D up here. <laughs> oh. You know, um, I, uh, I'm not sure where we are here. I'm, I'm here. Okay, it's just not there. For, for some reason, let's see, we've got to go back. There we go. No, wait. One moment, please. All right, we're going to start this thing in the right place. Okay. There we go. All right. When you consider your relationship with God, when you consider your relationship with God, are you caught in a life of servitude or are you caught in a life of servanthood? Servitude or servanthood? As, uh, as we have started this series and, and as we're preparing for, um, for that season where we, where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we are uh, looking at the book of John. And um, many of you may know, uh, as, as Bible scholars, that the book of John, the bulk of that book is dealing with the last days of Jesus' ministry. Um, and some have called it Cosmic John because you see many I am statements in there um, talking about the divinity of Jesus and also the humanity of Jesus. And um, so we're looking at a few key stories in leading up to that resurrection day that, uh, that changed the world forever. And, uh, and, and so today I want to talk about, about a, a story in Jesus' life that showed the kind of servanthood that, that was in him. And what, what is servitude then? And um, we have this definition of servitude, a condition in which one lacks liberty or freedom, especially to determine one's course of action or way of life. And you think about that, you can ask yourself some questions because servitude basically comes down to this. It's an attitude. Servitude is an attitude. It's a bad attitude. Now, you, you might wonder, um, in, in our, our service to God, if we are acting out of a sense of obligation or a sense of compel, compelling force from God, we can live our whole life being called a Christian, and Jesus gives this sobering scripture for us to continue, can consider. It says, many, many will say to me on that day, talking about the, the judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is one of the most sobering scriptures in the whole of the Bible to me. Because here they are living their whole life thinking that they are being Joe Christian or Josephine Christian, living the life and, and, and walking in, in that Christian way. And Jesus says, depart from me because I never knew you. But that is the key statement there. Do we know Jesus? Are we, are we living in a walk that is, is part of a culture that gives me a, a cookbook of things that I must do if I want to be part of the club? Or are we living in a relationship with Jesus and letting him rule in our lives? Because when it says, I never knew you, it's basically saying, you never knew me. And, and, and that is the difference. That is the watershed between servitude and servanthood. Because Jesus' whole life was based in an action and actions and words that were an outpouring of love 
from the love that he had with the Father. And truly, uh, it is not religion that saves us. It is a relationship with Jesus that, that takes hold of our life and transforms us and makes us more and more like him, that we serve out of love instead of out of obligation and out of fear and all of that. So you, um, you see servitude is an attitude. It's, it's an attitude, <laughs> but truthfully, it's a bad attitude. Because we are serving out of fear, out of obligation, out of um, a need for greater status, out of a need to please people, and in, and in all of it, we are wearing ourselves out, going through the motions of trying to appear rather than to be. All of life is a state of being. That's why God introduced himself to Moses to say, Tell them, I am sent you, a state of being verb. That, that everything about us is an outpouring of who we are. And that is the beautiful thing about Christianity, is it is, it is a whole process of coming to know who we are. That we become integrated with what God is doing in our innermost being, transforming us from the inside out. When we follow religion in a servitude kind of way, instead of a servanthood kind of way, we are, we are, actually, we are actually trying to focus on how to appear. And we, we, we lose sight of who God really made us to be. In, in servanthood, it is a reflection of our relationship, our living relationship with God our living relationship with a God who desperately loves us and calls us his children and, and wants to lead us. I mean, Jesus said in his word, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. As God works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure, we are becoming more and more like him. And in carrying out our will, we are actually doing his will and don't even realize it. That's, that's why in that judgment scene that Jesus talks about in Matthew, Lord, when did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you in prison and visit you? They weren't even aware that, that, they, were, that they were doing these things for, for Jesus. And he said, I tell you, the truth, as you have done it unto the least of these, one of my brothers or sisters, you've done it to me, done it for me. And, and so, so we are acting out of this, this love relationship that, that what God pours into us pours out of us. That is servanthood instead of servitude. So we, we struggle with this, with this idea of who is who is my picture? Who, who fits my picture of God? Is he exacting? Is he demanding? Is he punishing? Is he angry? Because if, 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 that's, if that's the motivation we're coming from, you know, oh, God's going to get you for that. You know, we, we've, we've heard different statements as, as we've been growing up, many of us, that, you know, if you go into that place, your angels won't go with you. Or if, if you do that, um, God is going to be angry at you and, and you're going to be punished. And we begin to serve out of servitude so that, so that perhaps we can gain God's favor. Per perhaps if I do enough good deeds, God will finally love me. And, and you know, the world, the world passes this lie off to us and God can look like this that like this very cruel being. And you know, the truth is, is that that's pagan religion. Because the, 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 the godless people, they believed in many gods, that if they, if they did enough good deeds and, and made offerings before God, that he, would, that he would favor them. Even in the time of Jesus, you know, uh, Lord, who sinned, the, the parents or or this man that he is blind, because they believe that God punished 
they had such a misconception of who God was. Ultimately, what it, what it leads us to is feeling like we're never good enough. Because it sets up this impossible standard that, that we have within ourselves. And, and we, we feel like no matter what we do, it's never good enough. And who are we trying to please? You see, oftentimes we are in a relationship of servitude without even realizing it. You may be struggling with being in, servant, in a relationship of servitude if you are, if you are caught in this whirlpool. Because two things can happen when, when this takes full bloom. We either become bitter legalists, judging everyone else because we feel so terrible about ourselves, or we just give up and we walk away. But I want to I wanna suggest that as, someone in servanthood sees God as a cheerleader, as an advocate, patient, <laughs> patient, and affirming, loving. In his eyes, you feel accepted. You know, I, I, I worked, I've worked for two different bosses in my life. <laughs> the first one, I don't even remember his name. I was in high school, and uh, I had a summer job putting up siding. I couldn't do it fast enough. I couldn't do it accurate enough. I, I was never good enough in his eyes. And even if I had a good day, he was always reminding me at that morning breakfast before we started to work that, you know, if I had a good day the day before, he reminds me of the, the weeks before that. I, I tried so hard to please that man. I worked harder. I worked longer. Sometimes I didn't even claim the hours I put in because if I was working alone just to get enough work output that I could please this man. But you know, I ended up being so burnt out and so discouraged that I made more mistakes. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't perform. And then I met a man who was the first man in my life that really believed in me and gave me a chance and you've heard me, many of you, talk about Charlie Johnson. I joined, <laughs> I joined the company, and he said I was no good. The only reason he hired me is because he liked Cheryl. He was Cheryl's Sunday school teacher. But really, truthfully, he, he gave me opportunities. Um, he, uh, he, he put me in a position where I had the luxury of failure. He protected me. He, he, he taught me lessons like, Rick, you're going to be traveling a lot, and I want you to remember that your family has as much of an investment in your job as you do. He said, one thing I've always done, if I have to travel all night long to be home with my family for breakfast in the morning, I'll do it. He said, it's worth it. He, um, he once sent us on a trip. He said, Rick, you've been traveling a lot. Um, I'm going to send you out to an ASTM, American Society for Testing Materials, conference that's in uh, Colorado Springs. And I want you, you pay for the airfare, but I will pick up all the meals, the rental car, and the hotel. And you take your family with you. We, we put on 1,000 miles in a week <laughs> after, after the meetings. But, I, but he, he put his... He put his values where in where his you know he showed those values in the actions that he gave and demonstrated he made me a better man because well I'll tell you what did I want to work hard for him I served him out of love and admiration I remember his name I don't remember that other guy's name I loved that man 
was a World War II pilot, and he had some colorful language at times. But you know, it, it, it was in that contrast that I learned that it, at one time I worked for God who was exacting and cruel and discouraging, and I never felt good enough. And sometimes I still work for that guy every now and then, but not for long. Because I learned that my God is a cheerleader. He is, he is always cheering me on. He is my advocate. He is, he is patient with me. He knows that I am changing in time. He's loving toward me. He has taught me how to love because he's poured his love into me. He's made me a better person, and I feel accepted by him. So our picture of who God is is absolutely essential into how we navigate through this life. Because when we work for that, for that God who we're never good enough for, we are in the wrong territory. Because the truth is that the God we, we want to know is our cheerleader. The one, the one who said, my image has been so obscured in that world down there that I created. It is so racked with sin and, and, and cruelty, and life has become cheap, and the picture of who, who I am has been totally obscured, and into the world God came in Jesus as a baby because he wanted us to know that he loves us and that we are important to him. And the image of God was restored in Jesus Christ, a servant serving us through love. One of the most amazing stories about Jesus in the last days of his life is an act of service that Jesus did out of his love for God and his love for his disciples. I want you to picture for a moment that he was in a room where he already knew that one would betray him, one would deny him three times, and all of them, except for one, would run away and hide. He was in that upper room on the last Passover that he would celebrate with his disciples. He was in that room for the last Passover. And all of the details were taken care of. I mean, can you imagine celebrating a Passover meal with Jesus? It, it, it commemorated the day when God liberated his children, the Israelites, from bondage in Egypt. And it was a Passover because God preserved the oldest son of every household that had put blood, the blood of the lamb, on the lintel and doorposts. And the room was all prepared. And as the disciples were filtering in, they noticed, they had to have noticed, one of the elements that was missing. Everything else was prepared. The food was on the table. Everything was perfect. But there was a basin and a towel and a pitcher of water, but no servant. And it was the, it was the custom. It was expected by, by the people who were invited by the host that there would be a servant there to wash feet. Either, either the wife of the household or the lowest ranking servant because the job was considered so menial and so below dignity of anyone that it had to be the lowest of the low that would do this. Because you can, you can imagine in those open sandals walking through the dusty streets <clears throat> where, there was, where there was animal excrement, where, where there was where people poured stuff out of their upstairs windows into the street that the dust would stink. And there was sweat and dust and, and dirtiness. And, you know, to touch someone's feet was considered just absolutely beneath anyone but the lowest of the low. 
And you can imagine as they walked through the door and they looked and they saw that absence, maybe one or two of them thought, where's that servant? I wonder if I should, no, no, not me. And one by one, you know, nobody did it. <laughs> nobody, nobody did it. Now, Jesus must have been the center of attention. They were reclining at the table, and the custom of the, of the day is that your shoulders would be toward the table, your feet would be out to the outside of the table. They were probably looking, is there going to be another miracle? What was Jesus going to say? What was he going to share with them? And here he is in a room where, where the disciples had been arguing who would sit at his right and who would sit at his left and who would be greatest in the kingdom and, and trying to rank each other in terms of their importance and their value. <laughs> and probably one set of eyes at a time would have noticed as Jesus began to move and got up from the table and started walking toward that basin and pitcher and towel. One by one, the disciples would look, and, and they had to be thinking, oh, no, what, what is happening? What? No, this can't be. This isn't, this isn't our, our revered master, our Rabboni, our, our, our Lord, our, our teacher, our, our Messiah. No. What's he doing? What's he doing? And, and he takes off his outer, outer coat. And he takes that towel and he, and he ties it around his waist, signifying that he is a slave. Their, their minds have to be going a, a million miles an hour and thinking, projecting ahead, is he going to wash our feet? I, I should have done it. I, I should have. I thought about it, but I, I didn't. And here's Jesus getting ready to wash our feet. And I imagine as that water pours out of the pitcher into the basin, that, that the sound is like thundering in their ears as the water cascades into that pitcher. And Jesus takes the basin, and one by one, washes the feet of his disciples. <laughs> he even washed Judas' feet, the one who would betray him. That tells you something, doesn't it? That no matter what you've done, Jesus tenderly, tenderly comes to you and washes your feet. We have some insight from the Desire of Ages that said, for a moment, for a moment, Judas's heart trembled within him as Jesus washed his feet, and then he hardened his heart and went and did what he had bound to do for 30 pieces of silver. And Peter, who said, Lord, I will never deny you. <laughs> I'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll die for you. Jesus washed his feet. And all those who had run away, Jesus washed their feet. Jesus, Jesus demonstrated what servanthood is all about. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? He did it because he loved his Father and he loves us. You know, John shares a scripture for us, an insight for us. He says, the same, as the Father has love for the Son, even so He loves us. That God's love is not divisible. God's love is not ranked. God's love for us is the same as it is for His Son. That we are that precious in His sight. And Jesus washing their feet shows us just how much He loves us. Because, because he became the lowest, the servant, to serve us so that we might live. 
as the story continues on, Jesus makes these conclusions. He says, when, when he had finished washing he, their feet, he put his clothes and returned to his place. And he said, do you understand what I have done for you? Well, he's done this for them, and, 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 and I don't miss the point. This is not something that they could do, do for themselves. Because there was something more than just physically washing their feet. When, when he did this for them, he was doing something that, that was supernatural and complete. He says, he says then after that, he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for so that is what I am. There's another I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. There's another important principle here. Notice that Jesus served them before they could serve others. Oftentimes, we get things backwards. We are engaged in working for the Lord before we have even let him serve us. We cannot, we cannot truly be in servanthood until we have allowed ourselves to be served by the Lord. When you run out the door without taking time for some kind of devotional time, or when you're sitting and talking with someone without even thinking about God and saying, Lord, what can I share with this person? How can you touch them through me? When, when I do not allow God to serve me, Jesus to serve me first, how can I serve others? Because I am, well, as, as a salesman once told me, you can't sell anything out of an empty wagon. And so Jesus continues on, and he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You see, when I serve as a servant of, of, of God and I receive his love, when I truly have a, a, a love relationship that God initiated in me, it overflows and I serve out of a, out of a life of gratitude. Out of, out of a life of of recognition of the power and the love of Jesus working in and through me. Like my dear friend Charlie Johnson, what I experienced from him, I have been able to multiply because I, I was loved. One day, my heart was broken by friends who came to wash my feet. I was at Union College. I was at Union College working hard to get my theology degree, and I, I was stuffing it into two years. I told them I have to be done in two years. I was doing impossible hours, plus all the practicums of doing a student pastoring at a church and and going out and doing guest preaching engagements and, and everything else that was involved in that. And I mean, I was working, 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 working. And one day my friend calls me up. He says, Rick, when are you going to come home and visit us in St. Louis? And I said, oh, Jody, <laughs> I, I, I want to. And I'm thinking of learning my Greek and vocab and all that stuff. And, and I said, I want to, but I've got one car that's not running and I've got another car that's not roadworthy for that long a trip. And he said, okay, well, well, just, you know, just wanted to check in with you. And uh, I said, as soon as I can make it, we, we will be there because we deeply loved that family. That's where we joined the church. 
And um, so I got a, a phone call about a week later, and he says, Rick, what are you doing next Sunday? And, uh, and, I, and I, uh, I said, oh. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, I yeah, you know, Greek vocabulary and homework and papers to write and reading to do. And, but I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> you know how you do that. And, and uh, he says, well, John and I, John was the pastor of the church. His name is Jody. Um, we have union business, and they came. They, they were going to come on, on Sunday, and they wanted to just say, say hi to us. And so, uh, so they come, come to the church or to the, to the house, and I see them pull up, and I'm studying my Greek vocab, and they said, oh, here they are. So they pull up in the car, and they, uh, I went out to greet them, and they said, hey, come here, come here, we want to show you something. And they opened up the back of the car, and it was filled with tools and car parts. And he said, Rick, our union business is we've, we've got the union, heated union garage, because it was in the middle of winter, and we have come to fix your cars. And I, and I thought to myself, how can I send them away? They've come all this distance, but the last thing I wanted to do was have my friends put themselves out for me like that. <laughs> but then, then the, next, the next shoe dropped, and they said, Rick, when I talk to you, when I talk to you, you just did not sound like yourself. And I, I told the church, and the whole church is praying for you, and we've collected an extra $400 because we're here to fix your cars. And if there's any additional cost, we've got it here. Well, I, the last place I wanted to be after that was in class. But in that moment was... was my friends had come to wash my feet. Jesus had sent my friends to wash my feet because I'm really good at serving when I can be in control. But I learned a lesson that day because God spoke in the back of my mind, not an audible voice, but clearly, it was a clear message, Rick, this involves your salvation. Broke my heart. <laughs> my friends came to wash my feet. And every, every moment I could, I was at that garage when the first car started. And they were so joyful because I allowed them to wash my feet. And then the second car. And I learned a very important lesson that day. Jesus taught it in the upper room to his disciples, and they would remember it afterward. That unless, unless we allow Jesus in to serve us, or Jesus to work through others to serve us, we cannot serve others. Like those... People who said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons and, and do all kinds of miracles in your name? You see, it's all about Jesus. It's all about seeking after him and letting him serve us. Bless us. Receive that blessing that we are able in turn serve out of the abundance of love that he has poured out upon us, in us and through us. So are you serving out of a heart of servitude and slavery? Or are you serving out of a heart of love that Jesus abundantly pours through you? in order to be a blessing to others. It's the most important question today. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, we are all part of one family, the family of God who loves us 
with an everlasting love. Lord, we are so aware of the kind of negative, contagious spirits and influence that there is in the world and the biological world. But Lord, make us a contagious people with a love that cannot be denied, a love that comes through helping hands or, or an understanding smile or, or tearful eyes or, or feet that take us to the places where we can be of service for you. Lord, help us to love you more, to trust you, to live in the light of your love, that you are our cheerleader, you are our advocate, you are the one who loves us, you are the one who accepts us right where we are, you are the one who will bring us home. Let us go now as people of light, contagious with the light of your love. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Be safe. We love you.